the same lack of coordination, the same preventable loss of lives and livelihoods, and the same social, economic, and political upheaval as we saw with COVID-19. We cannot allow the cycle of panic and neglect to repeat. We cannot forget the trauma of the pandemic and the painful lessons it taught all of us. I urge all member states to work together on the principles of solidarity and equity to find common ground, compromise, and to give all of us an effective agreement and a safer future. Now to Gaza. On Tuesday, the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification Partnership said that Gaza faces imminent famine because so little food has been allowed in. Up to 16% of children under five in northern Gaza are now malnourished, compared with less than 1% before the conflict began. Virtually, all households are already skipping meals every day, and adults are reducing their meals so children can eat. Children are dying from the combined effects of malnutrition and disease and lack of adequate water and sanitation. The future of an entire generation is in serious peril. In particular, malnourished children need ready-to-use therapeutic food that's targeted at their needs. There are some supplies of this type of food in Gaza, but it cannot be distributed safely to where it's needed. Recent efforts to deliver food by air and sea are welcome, but only the expansion of land crossings will enable large-scale deliveries to prevent famine. WHO has supported the establishment of a nutrition stabilization center at Kamal Adwan Hospital to treat children with severe acute malnutrition with medical complications who are at the highest risk of imminent death if not treated urgently. We're supporting the establishment of another center at the International Medical Corps Field Hospital in Rafah. And we're training health workers on how to recognize and treat malnutrition with complications. Meanwhile, Gaza's health system continues to suffer. WHO and our partners have been conducting high-risk missions to deliver medicines, fuel, and food for health workers and their patients. But our requests to deliver supplies are often blocked or refused. Damaged roads and continuous fighting, including in and close to hospitals, mean delivers are few and slow. We're particularly concerned about military operations inside and around Al-Shifa Hospital in Gaza City. Accessing Al-Shifa is now impossible and there are reports of health workers being arrested and detained. A planned mission to Al-Shifa today had to be canceled due to lack of security. Once again, we ask Israel to open more crossings and accelerate the entry and delivery of water, food, medical supplies, and other humanitarian aid into and within Gaza. Once again, we call for health care to be protected and not militarized. Once again, we call for the release of hostages. And once again, we call for an immediate ceasefire. Now to Haiti, where the security situation in the capital, Port-au-Prince, continues to worsen. The airport is closed, making it impossible to import essential goods, including medicines. The national port is operational, but accessing it is challenging as the surrounding areas are controlled by gangs. 
less than half of health facilities in Port-au-Prince are functioning at their normal capacity. And there is a pressing need for safe blood products, anesthetics, and other essential medicines. According to the World Food Program, 1.4 million people are facing emergency levels of hunger and need assistance to survive. The cholera outbreak, which has been declining since the end of last year, could flare up again should the crisis continue. Cholera response activities and data surveillance have already been affected by the recent violence. The situation would worsen significantly in the coming weeks if fuel becomes scarce and access to essential medical supplies is not improved soon. WHO PAHO is supporting the Ministry of Health and other partners with supplies and logistics, including water, sanitation, and hygiene, and is surveillance in centers for displaced persons. We call for safe and unhindered humanitarian access, the safety of health workers, and the protection of health facilities. We call on donors to increase financial support for Haiti. And we call on all partners and the public not to forget the people of Haiti. To say more, I'm pleased to welcome my colleague, Dr. Jarbas Barbosa, WHO's Regional Director for the Americas, and Dr. Oscar Barenesh, uh, who is representative to Haiti. And Jarbas, you have the floor. Thank you. Thank you, Director General, uh, WHO colleagues, uh, representatives of the media, media vehicles. Uh, as our Director General has already uh, stated, the situation in Haiti is very critical including after some days that we, we, have, we have observed a decrease in the number of 100 people related to gunshots in the last 48 hours. Again, we had a new wave of people uh, being, uh, going to hospitals to receive medical, uh, medical care related to gunshots. Around the, more than 50% of the health facilities are closed due to violence. And even to deploy uh, teams to perform cholera surveillance or to deploy medicines to the region where the cholera outbreak is still active has been very challenging because all the communications among the cities in Haiti are, are under uh, a very, very important uh, disruption at the, this moment. Uh, despite this fact, uh, the country office that represented this WHO and PAHO is working in the country, working with the other UN agencies, working with NGOs like Medicines in Frontier to provide the technical support to the Ministry of Health and to keep health facilities open. We have already delivered more than four tons of medicines and medical supplies to the hospitals in, in Puerto Prince that are, that are uh, still open, including the, the most important hospital, that is La Pé University Hospital, that is responsible to provide the emergency care for people uh, that, is, that uh, need this uh, emergency care there. So we are working together with these this partners, uh, assisting the La Pé University, providing uh, fuel to the center, the National Ambulance Center, uh, in order to, so they, 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 can get, they can have their vehicles moving uh, in the Puerto Prince metropolitan area and provide the transportation of the, the, the patients. We also have provided the blood supplies and consumables to the National Blood Transfusion Center, allowing it to resume blood testing activities. But as the Director General mentioned, we also have a very critical situation for the blood product supply. We are also working with the Ministry of Health for the active cholera outbreaks throughout the country, including the U.S. Department. More recently, despite the dire security situation, by strengthening surveillance through the deployment of the epidemiological surveillance offices. Uh, we have donated the medical and water uh, and sanitation equipment to the Ministry of Health, and we are deploying them to the most affected uh, areas. Uh, these actions are underway 
to re-establish health services in these sites as soon as possible throughout the resumption of more bioclinics supported by WHO, PAHO, UNICEF, and IOM. But we, we are still uh, looking for more partners and for more support in order to have at least the basic needs of the Haitian population being addressed. The, 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 the totally unstable situation and unpredictable at this moment can, in fact, be a very important barrier because the sites are closing, because people are not feel, feeling safe to go to the hospitals. Many hospitals have been looted, so it's a very critical situation as highlighted by our Director General. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Jervas. And uh, we look forward to hearing from you and also our WR, Dr. Barenish, uh, during the question and answer session. Finally, this Sunday marks World Tuberculosis Day. Each day, TB kills over 3,500 people, and the disease strikes close to 30,000 more. We're seeing some positive trends. Last year, we saw a significant increase in access to services for diagnosis and treatment, the highest number of people diagnosed since WHO began global TB monitoring in 1995. There is also some progress in the development of new TB diagnostics, drugs, and vaccines. Last year, I launched the TB Vaccine Accelerator Council to support innovative sustainable financing, market solutions, and partnerships for TB vaccine research. However, all of this progress is constrained by limited funding. So to mark World TB Day, WHO is launching a new investment case for TB to help countries advocate for more resources to close gaps in access to services for prevention and care. The investment case outlines the health and economic rationale for investing in evidence-based WHO-recommended interventions as part of every country's journey towards universal health coverage. This World TB Day, we remember the millions of people who lose their lives to TB every year and the millions who continue to struggle daily against this preventable and curable disease. We honor the health workers at the forefront of the fight to end TB. We thank the communities, civil society organizations, advocates, partners, and donors for their tireless dedication and support. And we commit to carry forward the fight to end TB. Tariq, back to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tadros, uh, for these opening remarks. Also, many thanks uh, to Dr. Jagbaz Barbosa, uh, WHO Regional Director for the Americas, and also thanks to uh, Dr. Oscar Barianetche, who is uh, our representative in Haiti, for being with us today and being uh, uh, staying with us for any possible questions. Besides Dr. Barbosa and Dr. Barianetche, we have also online uh, Dr. Uh, Maria Van Kerkov, who is uh, Interim Director uh, of Department of Epidemic and Pandemic Prevention and Preparedness. With us is also Dr. Rick Pieperkorn, a WHO representative uh, uh, for Occupy Palestinian Territory. And we also have Dr. Ilham Noor, a senior emergency officer leading uh, uh, WHO response in Ethiopia. If I have missed someone, I apologize. With this, we will start uh, with, uh, uh, with a session on questions and answers. And we will start with... Uh, uh, Robin Millar from AFP. Robin, please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, on the pandemic accord negotiations, uh, the letter from dozens of former world leaders suggests that, that there's a concern that this might not get done. Um, so what are, what are the key sticking points that remain? What needs to happen to get this over the line? And who needs to budge? Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you, Robin. Uh, we have uh, Dr. Jawad Marjou, who is uh, head of our secretariat to the INB. Dr. Marjou. Yeah, thank you very much for this uh, very important question. I think 
uh, as the director general said in his uh, introductory remark, uh, the member states uh, 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 in the INB, they agreed on the main objective and they now focusing on how to implement these objectives. For example, they agreed that uh, prevention is extremely important for pandemic preparedness and response, and this, they agreed that prevent pandemic is important and not to wait for pandemics to occur to respond to them. They agreed also that uh, raising the level of preparedness is extremely important uh, to all countries and also uh, strengthening the health system. They agreed on many things. They agreed on the importance of research and development. They agreed that the importance of having global supply chain to, uh, uh, to uh, bring all the countermeasures to uh, all countries who are in need. And now they are discussing on how to implement these issues. What are the partners that they 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 uh, they need to uh, uh, be involved in these processes, and this is now when the discussion is focusing. Of course, some 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 uh, areas or some subjects are more difficult than others, but they are putting all of them on the table and trying to find solution to all the 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 the, the, the problems. Steve, do you add anything? Thank you, Dr. Majur. Hope this answers the question. And then uh, we can move to the next one. Uh, do we have uh, Jamil uh, Chadev from Brazil, who writes for several Brazilian uh, outlets? Jamil, if you can unmute. Hello. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Jamil. Yes, my question uh, is to Dr. Tedros on dengue. Uh, which is uh, having a very huge impact in Brazil at this point. Uh, my question to you, are you worried? Uh, what else can be done in the case of Brazil? And where are we with the vaccine um, development on this story? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jamila. Uh, uh, we also have uh, our regional director for Americas who, uh, uh, who may uh, want to answer that uh, so, uh, Dr. Dr. Barbosa, would you like to take this one first? Yes, thank you. Thank you, Tariq, and thank you, Jamil. We have a, a record number of cases of dengue fever. We had the last year more than more 4 million cases. This year, in the first two months of the year, we are already getting another record number of cases. What is concerned, maybe we have a combination of the El Nino phenomenon with the, some climate change because the dengue fever is being experienced not only in the traditional areas, but even in the north of Argentina and other countries in the region, we have a very strong transmission at this moment. Brazil and Paraguay are the most affected countries. We are working together with the Ministry of Health in these countries, providing technical guidance and supporting them. We have two main uh, activities, Jamil. The first one is to strengthen vector control. The second one is to reduce the case fatality rate. Uh, deaths related to dengue, in general, they can be prevented if we provide technical guidance and provide training for the healthcare workers at the primary healthcare emergency, emergency rooms, public and private sectors. The vaccine is already available. Uh, Brazil is using. We are also offering the vaccine through PAHU's revolving fund for vaccines, but the vaccine will not be a response to the immediate outbreak. Uh, the quantity is limited, so we are encouraging the countries that are introducing the vaccine to establish a very strong uh, surveillance system to get more data now from real life utilization about the, the safety of the vaccine, about the effectiveness of the vaccine against the four serotypes of the dengue virus. That is always a challenge. So this is a concerning situation, but in some countries in the last two weeks, we are seeing that the, uh, for some countries, they are already close or are already in the peak of the transmission and working together with communities and subnational uh, authorities, they can reduce the number of cases and, most importantly, prevent all deaths related to dengue fever. Thank you for this question. 
Many thanks, uh, Dr. Barbosa, for this. Good to have you to answer these specific questions. Uh, let's go now to uh, NPR, National Public Radio. We have uh, Gabriel Emanuel. Gabriel? Hi, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask about the MPOC situation, uh, particularly in the DRC, but in general in Central Africa. I'm curious about the vaccine situation. Um, what's kind of hindering getting vaccines there, and what what's the prospect for for um, vaccines arriving in the timeline? Thank you, thank you, Gabriel. Uh, Dr. Van Kirchhoff, would you like to take this one? Yeah, thanks. I can start. So, thanks for asking the question around MPOC. So. As you know, we've seen a large number of cases reported from, of MPOX from DRC. In 2024 alone, there have been more than 3,000 suspected cases and about 250 deaths with a crude case fatality ratio of around 7.8%. Um, one of the things we're really trying to do is to better understand the epidemiology in the different parts of DRC. There are clearly different outbreaks that are happening. Some are happening um, among sexual networks. Some are happening with zoonotic uh, transmission and some family clusters. And this relates to your question about vaccines. Uh, we're working with our country office and DRC, our regional office, and many different partners to look at the types of interventions that can prevent infections, but also stop transmission. And one of those uh, interventions is vaccines. Um, we're currently looking at a number of different ways the vaccines could enter into the country, led by our country office, led by the Ministry of Health and the partners that are there, looking at bilateral donations, looking at the use of vaccines as part of a response strategy, looking at EUL, looking at PQ, a number of different options um, apply, but we're also looking at supply. Um, we're looking at how many doses could be available. And then, of course, the strategies in which those vaccines can be used in outbreak situations. SAGE met this week. There was a press conference from SAGE earlier this week looking at the use of MPOX vaccines in an outbreak situation. It needs to be um, tailored to the local epidemiology. Given limited supply, uh, limited availability of vaccines, we need to really be able to use those vaccines in a targeted way. Um, to reach those who are most at risk. And of course, that will depend on the epidemiology, who needs to be targeted, adults, children, um, MSM, sex workers, et cetera. And, and it will depend on our understanding of the epidemiology. So there are a number of countries that have put forth um, some donations, and uh, we're following up on each one of those. And we're also looking at the different ways in which the, the vaccines can get into the country. So lots of different uh, opportunities with different timelines, um, but there's a lot of active engagement with the country, looking with the different uh, regulatory authorities to be able to expedite that as quickly as possible. So thanks for the question. Um, and just to add to that, the, <clears throat> the vaccines that may be available to the nation um, also are not licensed for use in ch children, and they would have to be used in 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 in, in, a, in a in a properly managed process to use them off label or to gather the necessary data on safety and efficacy. The small amounts of vaccine are potentially available from a donation perspective. Therefore, they would have to be used very judiciously according to a very specific strategy. Uh, remembering that the vast majority of cases occurring, and correct me if I'm wrong, Maria, but many, many of the people affected are, are children under 15, under 5. So uh, we very much welcome the offers. Uh, we welcome the partnership with many institutions around the world, particularly in the U.S., with CDC, with NIH, USG, with uh, Antwerp. There are a number of different players, but uh, in country there are some very, very capable public health and research institutions that are working with those institutions. So pulling all of this together, we need to have a comprehensive strategy. Um, MPOX is a concern. It is a worry. It has been under surveillance for years since the eradication of smallpox for that very reason. As an orthopox virus, there has always been a, a fear that this virus could change its behavior in being a zoonotic disease, spreading into humans on a seasonal basis, causing very small outbreaks in usually in very rural communities. We all saw in the last couple of years when that MPOX transferred into a particular risk community and was able to spread around the world. Um, uh, and the, the, the MSM community deserve huge credit for effectively bringing that disease under control. Uh, themselves with the support uh, of of health authorities, with the support of diagnostics and vaccination, uh, and community action is a very important part of 
uh, of preventing smallpox transmission. It's not just all about bringing in silver bullets. It's about investing in communities so they can recognize this disease, about reducing transmission between people by people understanding the disease, diagnosing it, and avoiding contact with other humans when they have that. And then vaccination can play a very important part in that process. Uh, again, remember, Congo is going through, I think at this point it must be going through eight or ten different epidemics. We have cholera, we have meningitis, we have very other... It's, it's incredible how the health system continues to react and respond. We also have a, a deep amount of instability in the east of Congo. Uh, the peacekeeping operation has shut down there. Uh, there are many, many armed groups and, 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 and uh, operating in that area. <clears throat> so again, uh, a very difficult area in which to run any form of health uh, operation, particularly any form of vaccination. So the situation is complex. The capacities on the ground are remarkable. Um, I must say I, 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 I am in awe of the scientific capabilities within DR Congo and how they've been maintained over many years through many years of instability. We do have credible partners on the ground. We have fantastic scientific partners on the ground coming in from outside to support so I think the challenge now is to put all of those pieces together. Uh, we need to understand better the epidemiology of this disease, how it's changing, how it's evolving, because it's not just a threat in Congo. Um, it's a threat in the region. And as we saw with MPOX uh, in the last couple of years, can be a threat on a global basis. The one thing to remember with this particular disease, which is the clade one, it's the clade one, clade two, the disease that spread Mpox around the world uh, in, 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 in among uh, men who have sex with men and other groups was, was the clade 2. Clade 1 is 10 times more virulent uh, and has case fatality rates up to 10 percent. So this, this, this bug is badder uh, and it's more virulent and we really do need to keep a very, very close eye on it. So thank you for that question. It's important to keep the focus on these issues um, and again a reminder our partners out there that in the global appeal for MPOX control last year, uh, zero dollars were received in order to support that response. We were very lucky to have the donors who contribute to our contingency fund, but all of the resources WHO used in response to that were generated from the contingency fund. Similarly for cholera, which is affecting 31 countries right now, zero response to our appeal uh, on cholera. And all of the funds being used in that response are coming from our contingency funds. We will continue to do that under the leadership of Dr. Tedros and Dr. Jarbas and our regional directors around the world. But uh, it is very hard to maintain and support prolonged responses in very often challenging places like Haiti, challenging places like the Air Congo, who have excellent health workers, brave, courageous people on the ground. They will get the job done. We need to resource them. We need to support them. And we need to partner with them. So an appeal today to those of you out there, please support these responses and the organizations that provide that support, not just WHO, because these diseases won't stay where they are unless we endeavor to put them back in the box. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Van Kierkov and uh, Dr. Ryan. We will go to next question, Health Policy Watch, Elaine Fletcher. Elaine? Hi, thank you very much. Um, with all the caveats that you note just now about uh, MPOX vaccines, I don't believe I've seen any data produced by WHO on the need in, in DRC in West Africa and the availability of vaccines, uh, particularly from Bavarian Nordic, which is, as far as I understand, it's still the sole provider. I don't think I've seen any public conversations with Bavarian Nordic about how they could scale up their production. And we all know their facility was, was undergoing renovations last year and that created or contributed largely to the global shortage. So I'm just wondering if WHO needs to take the kid gloves off in dealing with this issue because it is so potentially serious, as you've said, both regionally and globally. But first of all, regionally. Yeah, we, we, I'm getting, asking, I apologize if I don't know where the numbers are, but I yeah. just haven't seen them at all. Well, and we uh, had that with, we had all those numbers out there and we were pushing through those numbers for, for more access. So mm -hmm. just not seeing that. 
Yeah, well, there are numbers. Thank you know you. that production capacity in the manufacturers is closely held proprietary information sometimes, but we have we have an idea of, of production. It's not just the MVA vaccine, there's LC16 vaccine from the Japanese side. Uh, one of the challenges with the MVA vaccine is that it requires two doses, and giving two doses of a vaccine with the time apart is a challenge in a complex environment. Finding the same person twice and vaccinating them can be a challenge. The challenge with the LC16 vaccine, which is uh, made in Japan, uh, is that it is one dose vaccine, but it must be administered into dermally, and those of you who are old enough will remember getting your smallpox vaccines and having the vaccine essentially scraped onto your skin rather than injected into your muscle. Uh, and that's not a problem. That's technically not a, an issue, but it requires quite a bit of retraining with uh, vaccinators. So uh, there's no, there, there are no silver bullets here. Um, and, uh, and I think Barbarian Nordic have been very open to discussing how they could scale up production. Uh, and obviously uh, working with... Uh, uh, I know that uh, Cefi and others are, are working on, uh, on on new vaccines or potentially uh, evolving sort of vaccine platforms, um, and uh, I do know that Gavi uh, and others are willing to engage around uh, how such uh, the, the existing vaccines beyond donations uh, could also be procured. So there is work going on in the background. I won't go into the, the, the detail of it here. Uh, but WHO is seized of that. But when we talk about taking the gloves off, yes, uh, we are taking the gloves off, but we're taking the gloves off to join hands in partnership, not to, to beat anyone around about the head. And, and if I could just comment on the need, so the questions on the need there, um, there are a lot of discussions that are happening right now on estimating the need. So we saw during the global outbreak that started in 2022, um, the different communities that were asking for a vaccine, the different communities that needed needed a vaccine, and, and you know where the available vaccines were used um, in the Northern Hemisphere. And in AFRO, our colleagues in AFRO, our co colleagues in DRC, and in many countries are looking at the local epidemiology, what is actually happening in country. And there's some enhanced surveillance activities that need to take place. And there are are very capable people, as Mike has said, and I fully agree, that can carry out this work to really estimate the populations that are most at need. But let's be real here. You know, if we look at the use of vaccines, when we develop strategies with country counterparts and local counterparts, we have to look at a number of things, not just the need, but what is the availability. So we have to have these contingencies and strategies looking at different types of scenarios. If we look at the different um, regions across DRC in which populations need vaccine, um, what is that denominator of the population? Uh, what is the denominator of the at-risk groups? And then how much do we have available? If we have X available, what's the best use of that vaccine in that country to stop, in that region, to stop transmission? If we have a little bit more, what can we do? So we have to think in a lot of different ways in terms of the strategies of how best to use. So agree, there, there are no um, kid gloves on. There's a lot of discussions that are happening um, with our partners. We had a big partnership meeting yesterday where we outlined uh, what we know in terms of the information. We had people from the country, from DRC, who were presenting what was ongoing. A lot of people are now actively engaged, and we're grateful for that. But we do have to look at the different types of scenarios and be realistic about how much vaccine is available, how quickly the vaccines can be used, and how they can optimally be used in different parts of DRC and beyond um, to have the biggest impact in stopping human-to-human -human transmission. Many thanks, uh, Dr. Rana and Dr. Van Kirchhoff, for these answers. Uh, let's go to the next question. We have Juliette uh, Perard uh, from Nikkei, Japan. Juliette? Yes, <clears throat> thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, maybe it's more a question, uh, really, talking about health emergency, uh, we would like to have more information and update on the international negotiating body that is uh, happening right now at the WHO. Uh, do you think the discussion and the pandemic treaty, as we call it, would uh, would have a chance to 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 reach a, a final uh, proposal for the general assembly that will take place in May? How is it uh, going on this uh, those discussion uh, in the drafting of the new pandemic treaty? Thank you, Juliette. Uh, Dr. Marc Jour talked a little bit about it, but uh, maybe uh, he can uh, or, Dr. or Mr. Solomon can uh, can tell more about the progress. 
Th thank you, and thank you for the question. So countries um, are working together, as Dr. Majore has said, and as the DG has said, and there are 194 of them. Uh, so finding common ground is not easy, but those countries working together found common ground in 2003 when they came together to work on the problem of tobacco control, and they concluded the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. And those countries found common ground in 2005 when they agreed on the international health regulations for dealing with health emergencies. So finding common ground now is doable, as the Director General said. Uh, like then, like back in 2003 and 2005, it won't be easy to find common ground. It will require compromise. But the good news is, as uh, Dr. Majore has said, that key principles have been agreed. Principles involving equity, fairness, and solidarity, transparency, and accountability. And the involvement of uh, civil society, communities, private sector, uh, community groups, um, like in 2003 and in 2005, will also be important in 2024. Uh, it's important to emphasize that this is a country-led process and a country-established process and a country-deciding process. And they, those countries, are systematically working to find answers to complex and key questions. And those questions include how to better share information, medicine, and vaccines, how to better prevent pandemics, how to better secure supply chains during pandemics, how to better build global manufacturing capacity to support diversified production of vaccines and medicines and therapeutics and diagnostics, how to more sustainably finance all this work that must be done. In some, the question they are looking to find answers to is, as the Director General said, how to avoid repeating the mistakes of the past and how to do all this before the lessons of COVID-19 are forgotten. So how to do all this by the World Health Assembly in May uh, of this year. No, just to remind ourselves that uh, the member state, when they created the INB, they, they decided to, to have a final outcome by the next World Health Assembly in May 24. And during the uh, ongoing uh, uh, INB discussion, no single country uh, challenged this, this, this uh, deadline. And all of them, they expressed this commitment to reach an agreement by May 24. And this is uh, something very positive, and I'm sure that they will find a way to overcome their, their differences by May 24. Yeah, um, I, uh, from the perspective of of health workers, public health workers, and people who you know operating around the world today, dealing with MPOX, dealing with cholera, dealing with potential pandemic pathogens, trying to strengthen their systems. Uh, communities were so affected by the pandemic, fearing the next one, wondering will they be last in the line again. Everyone went through the pandemic in different ways. We were all affected in different ways. Um, and, you know, I think this is a moment for world leadership. This is a moment where the ministries of health on behalf of their sovereign states, uh, and they still bear the sovereign responsibility for their health and protection of populations. But what we recognize with infectious diseases is they know no borders. Everyone knows that there is no way to affect, stop, mitigate, or reduce the impact of an infectious disease without working together. This treaty is really the promise to that future. It's a promise, as Tedros has called it, a generational agreement. It's a promise to the next generation. It's a letter to our children to say, we, the countries of the world, we, the leaders of the world, have come together and we solemnly commit to a process that we will try to do better the next time. We all know in the next emergency, the next crisis, nothing is ever perfect. But what we recognize is that we're much better when we operate with the set of guide rails, a set of rules that allow us to engage and behave in a predictable way in a crisis. Because there's nothing worse in a crisis than adding more chaos. 
that the response becomes as chaotic as the crisis you face. And that is the worst case scenario. We don't know what we're going to face. We don't know how bad it will be. We hope it never happens. But in doing and in preparing well, we will build stronger systems and we will deal with other diseases in a better way. We'll make our health systems more resilient. We'll train our health workers better. We will create more confidence and we'll create more security for our populations. So it's not just the benefit will be written in the next pandemic. The benefit will be written in everything we do between now and then. And people can sleep easy. People can live their lives without wondering, will the same thing or worse happen again? That's the responsibility. And I think it's a really important time that was spoken to the member states. Nine weeks and a couple of days, right? Nine weeks, four days. Can still be done. But it's really important that people out there recognize that, that people out there want this to happen. Because I sense in the room that the member states want this to happen. But the art of compromise, the art of convincing everyone in the, in the room that they've got the largest slice of the cake when, when you're trying to divide that as evenly as possible. So I, 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 I do think it's at a really crucial moment. We have huge confidence in our member states that they will do that. It's a process led by member states, led by a bureau, decided on by those member states, chaired by co-chairs, selected by those member states. This is an entirely a process of the member states. But the Secretariat and Dr. Tedros are doing everything possible to support and try and find ways to make that a successful process. Because the outcome matters here. The outcome really matters. The, the, uh, this isn't some dusty old document that will sit on, on a shelf somewhere. This treaty will save lives. This treaty will make better vaccines faster. It will make better surveillance systems to detect more quickly. It will build a better health workforce to respond when the time comes. It will save lives. Uh, maybe even not your life, but maybe the life of the person sitting beside you. Um, so from my perspective, may, people may think this is just a piece of paper. But when you work in this area for long enough, transforming pieces of paper into meaningful things that matter in the lives of people is the art of government. Uh, and this is the art of 194 governments to give us that piece of paper so that we collectively as institutions and public health practitioners around the world can give life to, the, to that aspiration. So it's very important that we take the, the discussion out of the dusty room and into the real world that matters and into the lives of people and the things that can change their lives and protect them and make them more secure. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Solomon, Dr. Ryan and Dr. Mahjour. Uh, uh, as we have Dr. Rick Peepercorn uh, online, our representative for Occupy Palestinian Territory, it would be really good to have uh, latest update on the situation there in terms of uh, hospitals and uh, WHO uh, activities, as we are getting many questions, not only for, from media, but from partners as well. So, Dr. Peepercorn, could you please provide a brief update on the situation in Gaza? Yes, right. Good afternoon. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very well. All right. So let me start. I mean, I think the DG referred to already a number of topics. And let's first start again with uh, the chilling figures. I mean, we talk about 32,000 uh, people killed, mostly women and children. We're getting uh, more than 74,000 people injured. And we know what kind of injuries uh, they are. And we talk about an estimated more than 8,000 people missing under the rubble. So you talk about 2.2 million uh, Palestinians in Gaza. And, and I think we've raised this so many times in, in almost epic humanitarian catastrophe. And, and we, we got this IPC report, widespread food insecurity and a looming, though I want to say completely avoidable famine, a risk of starvation among vulnerable on the pipes, et cetera, disease, et cetera, a lot of desperation and in amidst that of course uh and, and often a breakdown in, in law and order now i want to say something about shrinking space because in january and february the un uh, un's missions i think only to the north uh less than 20 percent got approved in March, we saw a slight improvement, and, and we as WHO, we went through Shifa, we went to Kamal One and a couple of other missions, bringing in supplies, uh, making assessments, food for patients and, and workers, and fuel. 
But today, for example, our mission to Shiba again was uh, um, was actually denied. We were planning, we were even asked to do that to provide fuel, some food for patients, and staff, and 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 to do a quick assessment. And and we uh, it was cancelled due to, to the ongoing insecurity in a raid. And this is again, I think we've raised so often. Uh, what is needed is an effective and a transparent, workable deconfliction mechanism. So we ensure that our convoys, uh, the UN are partners, and our facilities are not targeted. It means, I mean, this 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 convoys should not be unsafe. They should be facilitated, including through checkpoints, predictable and expedited. And it means also that all roads are operational. It will require more entry points, including in the north of Gaza, cleared roads, etc. And this is not complicated, absolutely not com uh, complicated. We've seen a decrease in health system functionality. Now, actually, we talk about 11 hospitals because Shifa is currently not really functional. We cannot call it functional. So five in the north, six in the south, partly uh, functional. Nasser Medical Complex, uh, a very important medical complex. We help, we want to help it revive and start up again. And I just want to mention Shifa was just bouncing back. And once again, it's an ongoing rate, will have consequences for this hospital, fragile functionality. We heard a lot about, uh, about malnutrition. And maybe let me say one or two words on the malnutrition. Uh, the DG mentioned clearly that if you talk about the North, you talk about one in three children underage, or two is acutely malnourished. Before this crisis, it was not 1%, it was 0 0.6, 0 0.7% uh, of the children were acutely uh, malnourished. And now we talk about between 12 and a half and 16%. Uh, uh, and this is actually, we have raised this, not only WHO, many other UN partners, we've been witnessing and reporting this on the day-to-day based for months and 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 it's quite shocking why so few seem to listen and act and it would be completely unacce unacceptable that gaza would slide into a famine and we are watching it's also completely unnecessary so we can revert this trend we also have to focus on food production food production in gaza poultry fisheries destroyed not functional that needs to be started and for who besides what the dg said Nutrition stabilization centers, we need to establish them in all key hospitals. We are already working in a number of hospitals, North, Central, and, and South. We have to combine this, which is a rapidly expand the so called community malnutrition uh, uh, centers and really flood the place with ready to use therapeutic foods, the so called RUGF, uh, working with a nutrition cluster, with UNICEF and partners, etc. This is there. It is possible, and we should bounce back. Uh, and lastly, because we get a lot of questions on, on Shifa, normally we always have contact with health workers on the ground. It has been impossible to establish direct contact. So we hear everything from secondhand and from media as, 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 as you do. We are, as we say, terribly worried about the situation because of the situation of health workers, patients, civilians, and, and because the hospital was bouncing back and again providing a minimal health ser uh, services, it was again even becoming the trauma center of the of the north. Now we get reports that the uh, surgical wards is damaged, bone, etc. We don't know. We have to verify and and, and check that, etc. We can report that that work health workers have been detained. Uh, which would be an utmost uh, concern. Again, we had planned the support mission today. We were even asked for that to provide fuel, food, and do an assessment. It was cancelled uh, and should not uh, be be cancelled. Maybe my last point is, and I think we have raised this already a couple of times, and that's an ongoing concern of us, is about medical evacuation. So, 8,000 plus patients cases uh, in Gaza I need referral. 26% are cancer cases, probably 43 to 50% war injuries, 5% kidney di uh, dialysis, 26 other severe in inpatient cases. Referral criteria at the moment, 
the medical evacuation is an ad hoc process. It lacks transparency. It has not, not produced re uh, results. We've only seen 2,630 patients uh, referred. That is nothing compared to what is needed. Referral criteria are not functioning. WHO is completely ready. We made proposals uh, for that. And we're constantly pushing this with all parties to the conflict. We want a functional medical evacuation, a transparent one, and something which, uh, which, which the, the patients which have a right for this better treatment. And having been myself uh, repeatedly to Gaza for longer term with my team there and reporting constantly, I've never seen so many severe trauma cases in my life. Having been seven and a half years in Afghanistan, never seen in such a condensed, never seen so many amputations, including among children, births, horrible trauma, spinal fractures, etc. Those patients deserve better treatments. And then we don't even talk about the, 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 the regular patients. Normally 50 to 100 patients daily were referred to East Jerusalem and the West Bank for their treatment. And 50% of that were oncology, cancer cases, etc. We need to get them out. We need to assist them. Egypt is ready to do that. Many countries in the region offer support and even some European countries offer support. We cannot understand why this is not working. We need all of you to, to put the build up the pressure and make this uh, and make this work. I think I want to leave it here. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Pieper Korn, for, for this update. Uh, with this, uh, we will uh, slowly uh, come to an end of this press briefing. I would like uh, to call on uh, Dr. Jagbaz Barbosa, our Regional Director for Americas, to, to give some closing remarks. Dr. Barbosa. Very briefly, first I just want to summarize that the situation is very critical in Haiti, as uh, we mentioned before. In the last 48 hours, it looks like there is uh, an increase in the violence because more people wounded by uh, gunfire are going to hospitals and emergency rooms. So I think that is critical that the global community can come together first to ensure that in Haiti we, we have a higher level of security, that we can keep the hospitals and health centers open to address the, the very acute problems that you have in Haiti, the highest uh, maternal mortality rate in the region, the cholera outbreak, but also to respond to this very emergent situation that you that we have there so medicines blood product products fuel everything that we need to provide the care that the people in in that country uh, deserve to receive and is in a very very critical situation i mentioned and just a brief comment in the region we have convened four face-to-face -face meetings to discuss the inb so i think that it's very important to have all the countries engaged and i can feel from my conversation with many member states that despite all the difficult and complex issues that have been discussed there is a very strong commitment to compromise to come together to establish consensus and to have the world better prepared for the next pandemic thank you thank you very much uh... Uh, Dr. Barbosa, for, for this update on Haiti, for reporters who are interested, uh, please uh, write us. We also uh, have uh, our representative, uh, Dr. Oscar Baganeche, who can uh, be available for interviews and to, uh, to answer questions on the situation in Haiti. Uh, with this, I will just tell you that uh, the audio and video file will be sent to, to our media list a little bit later, and the transcript will be available tomorrow from this press briefing. With this, uh, last word for Dr. Tedros to close the press conference. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Tariq. Uh, just would like to thank the members of the press for joining us today and see you next time. And also my appreciation to uh, Jarbas uh, and Rig and also uh, Barinesh uh, for joining us during this press conference. Thank you and all the best.